Hi everyone and welcome to AXA Coral Live. It's amazing to have you all with us. We've got a fab lesson today all about baby corals and the coral life cycle. Now, if you've joined in for previous years, we are normally broadcasting from the Kamabi Research Station. And that's on an island called Curaçao, and that's in the Southern Caribbean. So that's something you can look on a map um, maybe a bit later. Now, what is a research station? Well, it's somewhere where scientists live either for a short time visiting or for a long time permanent staff, and they go and live in these research stations around the world, not because they're part of universities, but because they're near the area that they're studying. So Kamabi is fantastic for studying coral because it's near the coral reef. So scientists will go and live there. There'll be dormitories or, or bedrooms for them. And there'll be other important things as well. So you've got laboratories. And I don't know whether you've got a laboratory at your school. Uh, there'll be diving equipment. So that's the equipment you need to use to go and explore the underwater world. And then there'll be the boats to get out towards the reef and then dive and think about and explore the coral reef. Now, the research is a way of saying basically trying to understand stuff through science. And so today, we're very lucky we're going to be joining one of the scientists at Kamabi and find out what they're looking at, what they're researching to understand the coral reef better. For obvious reasons, because of the coronavirus, it's not possible, very sadly, for us to get out to Curaçao this year. We're being hosted very kindly by the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth, and this is their Great Barrier Reef exhibit. The National Marine... Ooh. <laughs> that surprised me. Um, that's a, a honeycomb, a honeycomb, sorry, honeycomb, honeycomb uh, whiptail ray just, just gone past there. Um, and where was I? Um, so the National Marine Aquarium is run by the Ocean Conservation Trust. And they don't just do this sort of public engagement work, working with people, working with schools, using the aquarium to learn more about the ocean. They also do some really cool work in research themselves, and they're looking at seagrass. So you have meadows under the sea, and they haven't been having a great time. So the researchers here, the scientists here, are looking at how seagrass meadows can be brought back to their former life and, and abundance and everything else. But without further ado, and we're going to come into our lesson and we're going to find out a bit more about the coral, which we started off yesterday, that supports all these amazing animals you might find on the reef. And I'm going to give a quick wave and see whether we've got uh, Dr. Kristen Marhaver on the other end of the line. Hi, Hi. good morning. Fantastic good morning. to see you. Good. Thank you so much for being part of Coral Live. Um, amazing to have you with us. I'm so um, glad to see you again this year. I'm sorry we couldn't have you in person, but I'm so glad to see you. It's we'll have to we'll have to, to work out something next year. We'll have to we'll yeah, fingers crossed um and be fantastic to be without you. I've heard you've had a very um busy time over the past few weeks. Yeah, we've had a really busy year. The corals didn't know anything about lockdown, so they kept on doing what they do in the ocean and we tried to do as much research as we could. Fantastic. I'm really looking forward to this lesson on life cycles, but before we get in, get into that, uh, I'm just going to see who's joining us today. I guess we've got schools from the UK, USA, Spain, India, Ireland, Bermuda, and Canada. And they've given us some special shout outs. Um, so we have Richard Taylor, Church of England Primary School, um, we loved making our pollocks yesterday and are very interested to hear about a mummy with one million babies. So oh my God. 
I have a lot of explaining to do, I guess. <laughs> There's some explaining to get into that, but good morning to everyone, or good afternoon to everyone, Richard Taylor. Hi from homeschool is Emmy Posey and Micah. Um, hi, everybody. Um, grade three at the American School of Bill Bang. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, Miss, Mrs. Dennison and Mr. John's Key Stage 2 class at Irby Primary School in Cumbria. Uh, really enjoyed making edible polyps yesterday. <laughs> Please make sure Jamie has a glass of water. I had a bit of a choke on a on a <laughs> on a incredible edible polyp yesterday. I do, thank you very much. I do, I do. Um, shout out to year three at Acre Rig Academy. Hi guys. Hi. Um, Good afternoon. Hello. Where everyone is. So I'm just saying all of the times of day. All the time today. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, hello from Frozen Leatham. Um, it's very cold over here. Is, is, is it cold where you are? It is not. It's so pretty warm. It's hot. It's humid. The lab is a little cooler, but yeah, it's still pretty scorchy in the tropics. It's pretty scorchy in the tropics. Um, so we're going over to Wales, I think, now. And hello again uh, to Tongwin Lice, primary years three and four. Fantastic to have you with us. Um, hello from everyone in year five at Penthorpe in West Sussex. Hi, guys. Um, amazing class two at Lincoln Primary School. Hi, class two. Um, a big hello to class four at Westington Primary School in Derbyshire. Hi to everybody in Derbyshire. And um, last but by no means least, we have Mole Hibog from uh, uh, Trey Robert uh, Primary School. I loved the lesson yesterday. And it's fab to have you back with us today. So hi to all the students and pupils there. Thanks so much. Uh, you could have been anywhere, but you decided to join us here today. Matt. I know it's fab. But we, ooh, special one just come in. It's Monty and Hugo in Exeter. So a big shout out to Monty and Hugo in Exeter. Hi, hi. everybody. So, Kristen, yesterday uh, we we took a bit of a, 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 a different route to our biology learning, to our science learning. Uh, we got on with the bananas and biscuits uh, to make to make a sort of model, sort of model of a of a coral polyp. Um, and for, the, for 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 those who didn't join us yesterday. Uh, do you have a, uh, can you give us a, I know you've got lots to tell us, but sort of what is coral? Short introduction. Sure. What is coral? Um, <laughs> let's see. Imagine if you go all the way back in animal evolution, before feet, before fur, uh, before spines, before eyeballs, take all those things away. Everything animals invented in the last 400, 500 million years, go all the way back. So your only options are to have some skin, maybe some arms, maybe a mouth, maybe a little bit of skeleton. That's pretty much what a coral is. They're animals that evolved so long ago, one of the oldest groups of animals on Earth, uh, way before most of the fancy inventions were, uh, were innovated by animals. So they're in some ways very, very simple in their body form and um, what they do on the reef. But in other ways, it's pretty amazing that they survived this long and they managed to make it given that they didn't have as many tricks as, say, animals that can run or jump or use teeth. Um, and we're going to see a bunch of corals today that are two months and one year old and two years old. And as we look through those corals today, you'll get to find out more about how they've managed to survive on Earth for 400, 500 million years and how they make it their living if they don't have teeth or eyes or legs or spines or fur any of the other handy things that animals have invented. It's very, very, I mean, they, they, they sound like awesome that they're still here, that they must be doing something, something right. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> and and we, we've got this lesson, we've got a couple of things um, to clarify. I think what, um, one, one thing that we just might clarify now is, is that you, I think I may have sort of, uh, carelessly given you the title of the mummy with a million babies um, uh, yesterday on a call um, as some way of, of 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 giving across a sort of a, a sense of of what you get up to or, or what, why 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 might I have yeah how did that come about how did, how did I get that title well I ooh. I've never heard of a human having a million human babies, but I have helped corals, hopefully at least a million coral babies. Um, and that's partly because corals make babies in a really different way than humans. 
they can make them in way bigger numbers, um, way more often. And so today I'll get to show you a little bit about how a baby coral is born. And then you can imagine in your head that the scientists all around the Caribbean, including at Carmabi, have helped maybe a million corals make it to the reef. Definitely a million corals made it into the ocean um, here at Carmabi. But we, it's still to be determined if I'm really the mother of a million, million babies. Thousands, thousands. We'll start, we'll start with thousands. Um, we, 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 we've got, we're talking about babies, but we're, the other thing we're talking about is, is this phrase that's in, in the lesson title, this thing called life cycle. Uh, and, you know, if I think about sort of life cycle for a human, you sort of, you know, um, born baby, you have baby, baby grows up, baby gets old. And, and then there's the end, yeah, the end of the life cycle, that, 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 that kind of thing. What, what, is, what is a life, is that what a life cycle is? What is a life cycle? A small, what is a life cycle? Yeah, yeah, what is it? Yeah, well, every plant and animal on earth needs to somehow keep its species alive, right? Okay. Plant in your garden, it tries to make seeds so that, that those seeds can grow into new plants. Um, every bacterium wants to make new bacterium, so they'll divide in half, or they'll divide in half over and over, or they'll branch little pieces off the side. So every species on Earth has a way to make more of itself. Um, and often when okay. we think of a life cycle, we might think about a baby human or a plant making a seed, but corals have kind of a crazy way in between both of those approaches. Crazy. So, um, can, 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 can you take us on this crazy journey of yeah. finding out how corals make more of themselves? I mean, that's what we're talking about, life cycles, is basically making more of yourself. Exactly. Yeah, making right. more copies of your species so that your species can continue to live. Um, I think Ellie's got some pretty cool photos and videos for us, so she's going to help us take a journey through the life cycle. And once we get to some of the later stages, then I'll be able to show you some live baby corals under the microscope. First, we just have to start with a coral reef. All different species, all different colors and shapes and sizes. And in some coral reefs, you might have 50 or 100 different species of coral. You might have 500. But each species is going to have its own strategy. So today, we're going to talk about what happens when a coral spawns eggs and how those eggs turn into baby corals. So Ellie has a really cool movie. Well, first we also have to find it and take a video. So Ellie's gonna show you a movie of what it looks like when we're searching the coral reef to find a coral that's releasing its eggs. It's dark because usually this happens at night. We have flashlights, we have dive gear, we have nets, we have protective gloves in case we run into a jellyfish or something sharp. And once we finally find a coral spawning, stop everything and try to collect the eggs. Ellie has a really cool video of a big, huge star coral that's releasing bundles of eggs from all, the whole colony, all in a big wave. The whole colony will decide all at once, okay, now is my time to let my eggs go. And they'll come off the coral in a big wave and they'll start to mix in the seawater and swirl and float, mix around. Those eggs are gonna go to the surface of the ocean where hopefully they will get fertilized and start to turn into a baby coral. I don't have I don't have corals spawning in my lab right now, but I can show you what it looks like when their eggs are released in the water because I have this file. It's got coral eggs in it. So I'm gonna try to show you that, see what it looks like. Whoa. No way. So they, those those are those are coral eggs? They're all coral eggs. That's and so they 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 look kind of like um insect eggs or butterfly eggs or just some of the other types of eggs that you know students watching may have seen in their local environment but these ones are in in, in the sea is that is that the same kind of thing we're yeah. talking about most eggs start out as just one little round cell so most eggs whatever animal you're talking about are going to be a little tiny speck now some corals will actually release a bundle of 100 eggs or a bundle of 10 eggs other corals will just release individual eggs into the water. So those eggs have to find their mate somewhere in the ocean, get fertilized, and then they start turning into a baby. Now this is the part that's really cool because corals 
have to turn into a baby and then the baby has to swim around the ocean and find a place to attach. That is an unusual and pretty weird part of the life cycle. So um, Ellie has a video, a time-lapse video of what happens after these eggs start dividing and turning into a baby. And it's going to go super speed. I think it's about 300 or 600 times faster than it would happen in real life. So one okay. egg and it turns into two, and then four, and this will happen overnight as those eggs are floating around in the surface of the, the ocean. So this is gonna take hours and hours. Some corals take three days to go through this process. And at the end, this egg is gonna go through all of these different divisions and turn into a little swimming larva, like a worm or like a tadpole, kind of like a baby tadpole, like a baby frog has a little swimming tadpole. Um, but then that, that baby has to search the entire ocean for where it's going to live. So imagine if you were born and then you just had to swim through the whole ocean and pick one place to live for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. You didn't have any help. There's no one there to feed you or take care of you or help you. You just had to swim through the ocean when you were about 10 hours old looking for a place to attach. <laughs> I can barely believe it's true as I'm explaining this to you. So I think Ellie has a video of coral larvae that are swimming it's a really short video and it has one coral just whoosh through the microscope and then it has a close up of the surface of the coral itself with all of the little hairs on its surface that it uses to swim. Ellie's really pulled up right now. So these little larvae are swooshing through the ocean swimming, but if you look really, really close at their surface, they're covered in all of these little tiny hairs that are helping them to swim. Okay, so you're born cool. one millimeter big, and now you gotta use your fingers to swim through the whole ocean by yourself. It sounds it sounds tough out there. It sounds tough. And and, and so you're you're find, trying to find your your home. And and so you don't have any eyes, you don't have any ears, nose. How how do you how do you tell? How do you do it? No eyes, no ears, no really no hands. No legs. Corals, even though they look like these little tiny blobs when they're babies, they can sense almost everything that we can sense. So they don't have eyes, but they can sense light. They don't have faces or, or, or tongues, but they can sense flavors when they run into surfaces on the ocean. They can feel the, the sound waves that are going through the reef. So they have all kinds of amazing abilities to find their way around, even though they're just these little tiny, little teeny tiny swimming dots. Their goal is to find a safe place to attach on a coral reef because most of the time that is where they will stay for the rest of their lives, a hundred years, a thousand years, five thousand years. They're going to pick one place and stay there. So imagine you're 10 hours old, you're swimming with just your hairs, <laughs> And then you pick one place somewhere in the ocean and you stay there for the rest of your life. That is a really important decision. And you don't want to mess up. Uh, is, is, there, is there a question that's like, why, why does it choose to stay in, in one place? Um, is that a stupid question to ask? No, if that's, a, that's a great question. Yeah, it's a pretty risky decision to not move after you, after you glue yourself to the surface, um, that's kind of the, the strategy corals chose. They chose to attach themselves to the reef and then build a skeleton in place. And after that, it's very hard to move when you're glued uh -huh. to a coral reef with a skeleton underneath you. Um, it's really hard to move after that. So corals have a really important job when they're picking where to look because they usually don't get to move after that. Maybe they'll break off or maybe they'll roll around at some point, but most of them don't really move very much. So when they're attaching to the reef, that's when it gets really cool. And that's when they start to look kind of like a coral again. You've got your little tiny swimming larva, it's going through the ocean, it's searching around, it's feeling and tasting and trying to not get eaten. And eventually it's gonna stick in one spot and it's going to turn into a single coral polyp with arms and a mouth a little tiny stomach and a little tiny skeleton. 
And I have those babies here to show you. <gasps> no way. Two months old. They're really, really small. Um, you can, you maybe can see them with your eyes if you have really good vision. But I came up with a way to describe how tiny they are. If you look at your fingerprint or your handprint or your toe print, you don't have fingers and hands. Look at the little tiny lines on your fingerprint. So like, like the okay, fingerprint lines, okay. Pick two of those little tiny fingerprint lines. Yeah, yeah. A baby coral is that wide. If it's no way. Here, it would cover two fingerprint lines. I, 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 I can sort of imagine that there's, 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 you know, all those watching this just looking at how tiny that is. It's and really and that's two, two, two months old polyp would be two, two. Can we have a look? Can we see what, what, how, what it is? We can. This is why we invented microscopes, because we are not very good at seeing small things. <laughs> As everybody who's squinting at their fingers right now is, is finding out. So that's why we have cool gadgets in the lab like this microscope. And it's looking right now at a two month old baby coral. And this camera is gonna send the photo from the microscope to another computer that's sitting right here. And then Ellie's gonna show you what's underneath the microscope. I hope that this works. Ready? <laughs> yeah, so what, what can we see? All right, are we viewing it? So I'm gonna play with the lights a little. I'm gonna zoom in, in a little more for everybody. All right, that's cool. So here's two baby corals. They're each half a millimeter wide. The one on the left is much darker. Here is the whole baby coral here. Got six teeny tiny tentacles. Can you count them? There's one, two, three, four, five, six. It's got one teeny tiny mouth in the middle. Right underneath this little piece here is a piece of its skeleton that it just started to grow about six weeks ago. That is a two month old baby coral, the size of two prints on your, two lines on your fingertip. And, and you, you, it seems like it, you're, you're talking about this stage between it being a sort of just soft tissue larva, larva to making a skeleton. So it's got a sort of a pre-skeleton stage. Ha does it, is it a skeleton like our skeleton? Is it inside? Is it how 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 how's that working out for it? That's a good question. Is it a is it a skeleton like ours? You look at this little tiny circle here. That doesn't look anything like a Halloween skeleton or like a spooky skeleton. Corals do something funny because they don't really make a skeleton inside their body. They make a skeleton underneath their body, and then they add to that very slowly through time. So instead of just growing big, like we do, they grow up and out and they leave the skeleton underneath. It would be like every, every year you sort of get taller, but you have like a big pile of like old feet underneath you that you just built up in a big pile. And then that's how you get taller and taller. So they okay. build up a big pile of skeleton and then they just live at the very top. Oh, wow. So this and, is both starting to build a little teeny skeleton, but right now it's probably just a circle and it's probably just like three little bridges. And so, so what, what stage is this? I've got an egg, then I've got a larva, and then what, what's this stage called? This we call a primary polyp uh, settler, or we come and just sometimes just call them settlers. Um, you can just call them like a single polyp juvenile. So this is the stage after the larval stage, the primary polyp juvenile. And then their job is to grow for a thousand years. So this wasn't even the, the only hard part. Now there's another hard part where they have to start growing and making copies of themselves. 
that, that you, you sound like you say that as if it's completely natural, but a way of making more of you is to clone yourself, is just to, to, to make a, a sort of a magic copy. Because I've, I've, I've probably seen that in some films and some science fiction films, and, and now you're telling me it's true. Right. So after they are 10 hour old baby swimming with their hairs and then searching the whole coral reef and gluing themselves somewhere, um, then they just make copies of themselves because why not? They can do, <laughs> they can do anything they want that they invented. Um, so instead of trying to just get bigger and bigger and bigger, like a human baby, they just stay pretty tiny. They get, they get a little bigger, but they mostly mostly grow from there by just making copies of themselves. So you have attached okay. yourself somewhere for the rest of your life and then you make a copy of yourself and then you make copies of yourselves. And then pretty soon there are a thousand Jamies in kind of a dome. All in That's one a place. scary thought. <laughs> <laughs> so if I look behind me, the sort of, you know, the sort of reef structure and for people who've watched finding nemo or seeing documentaries or even been diving how how does does this this single settler polyp go from that to so this that, yeah it takes a long time i can tell you that because i've been watching it the last few years and it takes a long time but i can show you an example of a baby coral that is starting to divide so right now we're looking under the microscope at the two month old corals. And now I'm going to switch it over and show you a one year old coral. It's much bigger. It looks a lot more like a coral and it's making little tiny polyps off to the side, little copies. And what I'll do first is I'm gonna show you the skeleton so you know kind of what it's looking like underneath. So this is a really big coral colony that probably spent 10 years making copies of its polyps. Question um, from Lee Wicks, who, who um, I didn't, don't know whether we've shown that exactly in the video, but how do you, how do you collect the eggs, eggs underwater um, and can you use a very fine net? Is it a bit like going shrimping with a shrimping net in sort of rock pools? We didn't plan this, but I'm going to pick one up right here because it's on this table. We have an arts and crafts element to our job, which is doing things like building nets to catch coral eggs. Uh -huh. so are big domes of fabric. And we've got weights on the bottom, which are sometimes rocks because rocks are free. And there's a funnel on the top and there's a little tube lid on the top. And then what you can do is you can go to the reef with your tube and you can put it on your coral net, and then you can collect the eggs in the tube. And Ellie actually has a video of one of these spawning nets in the ocean squishing left and right with a bunch of coral eggs um, accumulating in the tube. It's um, sometimes very hard to find and sometimes it's a very rough, crazy dive, but as long as we get a few hundred eggs or a few thousand eggs, we can usually still do some science. Fantastic. Really great. I, I, I hear that we, we have your microscope hey. on stream. So I think we we're going to look at a couple of things. One of which is, is this, this, this coral, which has cloned itself, so made copies of itself, because um, that sounds bonkers. Yes. All right. So you have to imagine this coral is about a centimeter and a half now. And there's one big polyp in the middle, which was the first one that attached. And then it's made copies around the edge, but the middle polyp is bigger. So when we look at the microscope, we have to kind of, we'll, we'll look at the, the middle polyp and then we're gonna zoom down and try to see the others on this side. Kind of a little hidden, right? Ready? Let's check this out. Okay, so here is, I'm gonna go to the middle of this coral. I'll try to show you a little bit of the tour. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so this is the mouth of the polyp, real middle, and it's just blurry a little bit because that's how the lens works. The lens has to be sharper for us to see much sharper. 
And now we're going to go toward the edge of the little tiny colony and see if we can see the other, the other clone polyps on the side. We go up. There's two more. They are. I, yeah, I can see those. Yes, there's, so there's two sort of sort of semicircular shapes. Exactly. So that's one. That's that primary polyp that we talked about, and then it has made little tiny copies of itself off of the side. And the big polyp in the middle is still really big, so it's kind of hanging over the others. Um, but if you want, I can show you a two-year-old coral also, which I have right here. And yes, please. You see the process of them making more and more and more copies. Yes, please. Ready? Yes. My flashlight here, and then I've got to tilt my whole camera over, um, and we'll see if this works. Ready? There we go. <sighs> Hello. Get the glare off there a little for you guys. There we go. So this is a coral right here. Gosh, it's probably got 10 or 15 polyps now. Yeah. They're all copies of them of each other with the same color and the same shape. And that coral is two years old and it, we grew it right here at Karmabi from one of those little teeny tiny eggs. Now this Amazing. one, uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't believe this is real, truly. <laughs> this one is a different coral species. It makes much teenier, tinier polyps, but it's probably made, gosh, what, 50, 70? It's made a lot more polyps in the meantime. Oh, wow. And then this cool, crazy brain coral is two years old, but it's pretty much just two. Actually, it's got like five mouths in the middle of there. So it's making copies of its mouth, but it's mostly just making <laughs> making one big sort of maze shaped brainy shaped colony so depending on what coral species you are you uh you might have big fat round polyps you might have skinny maze shaped polyps you might have little teeny ones uh, but they all have the same general strategy of making copies and growing as as big as they can it, it's fantastic question thank you thank you so much much for, for, for showing us that because I've got this really great sense for, from that sort of, of, the, of the stages of the life cycle and then from there helping to create this extraordinary structure um, that then provides a sort of wee home or big home uh, for so many other uh, species um, out, out on the reef. We, we haven't got very long which is absolutely gutting um, but we do, uh, we've got stacks and stacks of questions. If we don't get to your question today, because we've got so many great ones, um, uh, in this session, we will see if we've got time to add them on to the next session. And if, in fact, we'll just make sure that we, we keep on going until we've, we've got through them all, uh, for, 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 for the next session. We don't have anything, we don't have anything after the end of that one. So we've got time to... We can we can just sail sail into the distance with with all these great questions. But if I could do a quick 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 fire, um, Tom Year Four at Tongwen Lice School is what is the coolest coral structure you've ever seen? Oh, the coolest coral structure! Ellie has a picture of me next to a pillar coral that is enormous. It's so big. I am like this little tiny speck of a scuba diver in the background. Um, that was Perfect. one of the coolest corals I ever saw. It was enormous. And that was that species too, so I was really lucky to see it. Curacao. That was in Curacao, yeah. Just this way a little bit. That way, that way a little bit. That way. Um, why does, this is from uh, Richard Taylor Primary, why does coral live in water? Why does coral live in water? Um, I yeah. guess because we evolved in the ocean, and I don't think they would be very good at um living on land because they're very like gooey their tissue is very gooey i think if they lived on land they would be kind of like bogged down by the gravity so i think they need to be in water so that um the water helps like hold parts of their body up they probably also use the calcium in the water yeah good question land there we go 
Uh, all life started in the ocean, and only only the only some of it made it out. Yeah. Um, we'll, 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 we'll flip that question around. Um, so um, we've got Irby Primary. How long did you have to study to get your really cool job? How long did I have to study? Um, yeah. I guess I kind of feel like I'm still in school because I still do research and write reports and kind of feels like, kind of feels like it's, it's, there's never, there's never like a change. You're kind of learning your whole career. But I did, I went to college um, for four years and then I went to grad school and did a PhD, which was like five years, call it five years maybe a little longer <laughs> but it was really fun it didn't feel like oh i'm stuck in school it felt like this is fun and i get to discover stuff and and this question from from linton primary is what is what do you enjoy most about your job oh my favorite part is yeah. get to make discoveries um because i know they're going to help people i know that it will help conservation and it'll help other scientists but also because when you see something that you know is really rare or that you know you are the first person in the world to see, it's really, really cool. It feels, it feels awesome. Ellie has a tiny, tiny video of something we saw this year that I helped to discover, like a four second video of a coral releasing eggs from its mouth. Um, this is called the pineapple coral. And it took us years to find one of these releasing eggs. And it took even longer to get a video of it. And the first time I saw it, when I knew that I was sort of discovering when it happened, I, my heart was racing and I was, my heart was pounding and I was breathing fast and I was smiling and trying to take a photo. It was, it was so cool to know that I was seeing something that people hadn't seen before. It's, oh. Massive, massive joy to have spent this lesson talking with you, Kristen. Uh, and thank you so much for talking about this life cycle. We were, will put online, we did have a side-by-side -side picture of the life cycle of a frog, probably which uh, quite a few uh, students will have, may have studied, and, and then the life cycle um, of a coral polyp side-by-side -side so that they can have a, have a look at those back in the classroom. But Christian, thank you so, so much uh, for being part of Acts of Coral Live once again. It's, it's a treat um, to speak to you every time. And I know we've got a, a, another lesson for slightly older students in a bit. Uh, but for now, bye-bye and bye-bye to uh, all the students who've been watching. It's been fantastic having okay. you with us and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I, I'll see you soon, Jamie. Thanks so see much for joining us today. I